Welcome to Deming Chronicles Season 2, where we bring you ideas that can change our conversation. On today's program, we have Julie Ferguson. Welcome, Julie. Hi. Hi, Denise. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And Alima, Sonia Dumas. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. Deming Chronicles. We'll be back with you shortly. And on this program, this week's program, we have Julie Govaya Ferguson. Welcome, Julie. Julie, I know you as a lecturer at Costat. What about our country that brings you joy? Wow. Okay. There's so much. Let me try to limit that. Um, I think our diversity. I think we have this kind of cosmopolitan um, environment, nature. Um, I love particularly the different expressions of culture. You know, I'm from St. Jean, so we have everything here. So um, my kids are confused because they're like, you're Catholic, you're Hindu, or you're Muslim? Because we celebrate Eid, we celebrate Diwali, we build Tajas. Um, we light for Diwali, you know, it's, it's all, it's also embraced, it embraces everything. And I love the diverse nature of that. I love that the, the whole um, environment, I love our spirit, our spirit. And that is such an important issue, the spirit of the Trini, and you describe it as being the essence of it coming from St. James. But yeah. you are now operating as a senior lecturer at Costart. Tell uh -huh. me, how do you keep your students engaged in this online environment? Okay, in the beginning, I will be honest, it was really challenging because um, in a classroom, I am com I'm combustible energy. So it was a bit difficult and challenging to get it in an online space. But the good thing is I actually taught blended hybrid classes. So they have, in, in, they have experienced me in both, in both spaces. Um, I'm a visual creature. So I exist in a visual orbit. And as a result, just transferring that from a face-to-face -face environment to an online environment, I continue. So my lectures are vibrant. They are not um, simply text on a page which could bore them. So you have to keep them engaged. And I do that by my energy. So I make them, um, I do lectures on my own. Um, I, my, my classroom, my e-classroom, we use Moodle is vibrant, there are a lot of imagery. Um, there's a lot, a lot of imagery. If I tell them there's a quiz, I can't just simply put that in words. I have to put that in a visual. So I have some kind of task with somebody building a house and I'm like, your task this week. Um, so it, it, you just, you simply have to find ways. That's just the bottom line. And I do that in a visual capacity. But Julie, it, you might be lucky because as you describe yourself, you're a graphic person. You see everything in terms of visuals, but that's yes. not the, the experience of all lecturers. So what would you suggest to persons who were schooled in the textbook and the paper and the blackboard or the whiteboard? What is your suggestion? Um, Hawk, I have done that already. I mean, we've had webinars at Costat and I recently completed about three of them for the online um, faculty, as well as for, it went worldwide, um, where I did something called Stop Boring, Create Engaging Presentation. So I tell them, you know, when you have a lecture, how to transform it from words on a page to a more engaging visual lecture. And sometimes the imagery is thought provoking. So you may be speaking about another aspect of your and it doesn't matter what your industry is, if it's med medicine or IT or business or languages, you could always find images that complement your message. And by that, um, using that, you engage the students further. So they're not just reading. I, am, I'm, I do not subscribe to showing um, lectures or having lectures, whether it's remote sync or an asynchronous space, where it's just words and you're reading it. I really want to say, okay, you know what? You just be quiet because I could read. So give me something that engages me. And that's what we do. We've done webinars. We've done workshops um, for faculty for finding ways to engage your students in a visual capacity. So the advice is check Julie. Yes. 
<laughs> yes. you, do, you have a unique way of describing your class, something about a sanctum. Tell me about it. Oh, yes. Um, it's, it's my sanctum sanctorium. Um, I think, I know people may think, what did she just say? It's my holy space. It's my safe space. So when you walk into the class, um, it's not a matter. And I'm talking remote, synchronous, or face-to-face. -face. You have to, you, you don't necessarily, you can't necessarily at all times leave everything outside. You have to, um, you know, it's part of life, you know. But you, I do things in a way that, you know, the silent students, um, the ones who just sit in the back and don't want to speak, the ones who sit in the front and only want to speak. You have to find a way to engage the others. So I move. I never sit to teach. Um, likewise, when I'm doing my Zoom sessions or Google Meet, I constantly change my back backgrounds. Um, it may seem as a distraction to some, but... At the same time, I'm engaging them in a specific topic, a specific theory. Mm. So, Julie, I want you to think five years down the road. What is the creative space that you are preparing our young people for? What, what are the elements of that creative space? And are you selling them a dream? Absolutely not. I'm not selling them a dream. And actually, graphic design is one of the growing fields at my college. Um, it's because, okay, you said five years down the road. I really want to say it in answer to that. Been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. I have students who I keep in touch with them, you know, because you just can't let them do a degree. And then you say, okay, bye, congratulations, very well done. You have to, you know, you keep up with it. So I constantly get messages from them about their success or their challenges. Miss, oh God, I had this thing to do and I just didn't know where to go. Um, where to start and we talk about referencing and we talk about um, broadening experience and one of the things I deliberately tell them is you see that phrase think outside the box just burn that because nobody puts you in a box I'm not in a box be open and ex embrace the experience five years down the road from now I expect to continue hearing from my students of their successes whether they've designed a new billboard or a new product or a new logo um, and it's gone viral. And oh my God, I got feedback from the, the CEO or the creative director from A, B, or C, you know. Um, and that just lifts their spirit so that they are able to be inspired to do more and be go beyond, you know, take that trajectory higher. I also, um, what I get from them is they don't stay in the same space. So even if they are successful in something, they reach out to others. Um, clients or other design spaces where they can now expand their knowledge not and get a better dipstick of what design is in this creative industry once you you know it and it doesn't i really don't believe it's raw talent because i have some who send me successes and i i they know i'm very blunt so i'll say what you do that a real impressed boy you surprised me and they'll say but miss why i say that because you were so you know, lethargic, you know, and it's really great that now you're energized. So five years from now, I expect more excellence from my students. And Julie, think of the industry that we're operating in. And I think my view is that it tends to be repetitive in terms of the imagery that we see. How can we open up that space so that the imagery is a little more reflective of our own personalities? Um, well, that's kind of a two-edged sword because when you talk about our own personality, you, you know, if you're talking about the individual, um, you have to consider that you're working for a brand. Let's say you're working for an industry and that brand personality may be sophisticated, elegant, and you may be raucous and rogue. So your personality express in the brand. Um, I think staying current. Mm -hmm. But this seems to follow. Um, and okay. I might add stuff like um, Chris Doe, Dot Lung. These are people, Dot Lung is the mother of social dragons. That's how she, that's how she has um, labeled herself and her work is off the chart. Um, and I think once you start to unpack what the industry has and what technology has to offer, you can take yourself into, there is no end in the stratosphere of design, but you must be willing to not just um, I mean, there are ethics, 
and I, I appreciate that. So there's certain ethics that you have to take with you in that I'm not going to do that. I don't feel comfortable with that. This is my professional um, experience. This is my professional advice to you as the client. But I think when you get into personality, you have to be aware that it's not about you. It's about the client, the client's brand, the space, the target market, the audience, the, the people that are out there that you're advertising it to or you're promoting this in, in the environment. So you have to be aware of that and you have to have a broader picture as well. Because when we talk about the sustainable developmental goals, even if you do, you have a lot of plastic in your house, you have to appreciate that I'm not going to promote, um, I'm not going to just jump out of myself and decide, um, you know, I'm going to promote this, but it's, it's so against climate change. You have to be aware of a lot of stuff. Mm. And sometimes your personality may clash. <laughs> yes. And Julie, tell me something about your background, because you, you seem to be very energetic, very forward thinking. How did that happen? Um, the, I would say it started with my parents. Um, they encouraged me in art. You know, it was not all about the industries that are, you know, uh, reputable and recognized. Um, they encouraged me. So I went on to Howard University and I did my fine arts because art is my first passion. It's my first love. So anybody who knows me knows that Julie and Frida Kahlo are synonymous. Um, and from there, I started working at um, WHMM in tuning in television. So then it was a des different design space. I also, my mentor, Dr. Scarmanda Bullock, she had an agency. So I was working in that kind of space, agency space with a lot of print production. And then I went to WHMM. And from there, I went to Washington City Paper for like 10 years. Um, and that was a different space, a different design space. Um, so the experience abroad and then coming back home, I always said I would come back home to give back. Um, and I just haven't left yet. I don't think I'll, and that's not on the front burner right now, but it's, it's, it's broad, this, my scope is broad. And in between all of that, my clients have my own company that I started in the States. And so I have varied, diverse clients who sometimes can't take all of this combustible energy. <laughs> 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 and Julie, how else do you release that combustible energy apart from in the classroom? Well, you see, you for me, life is design and art. And so I eat, breathe, sleep, bleed design. Um, I take it with my two girls, um, even though they are pursuing different fields. Um, and it's just, it's something that I, I feel really abundantly blessed to have. So I must share it. I work with, you would know, of various volunteer organizations, Sir Optimus International, I'm a member. And so I work with them in the scope of design as well as the projects that we work on. Um, I work with Mama Toto Resource and Build Center. So I do work for them as well. So it's, I always find, and you know, volunteer, I always find ways, not that I'm going looking for it necessarily, but they cross my path and I take that journey. And Julie, as we bring this interview to a close, Give us some parting comments. What would you like people to have remembered about Julie? Um, I would say balance. Um, and this is what I live by. Um, there must be balance. This is we breathe in, we must breathe out, we hope. Um, I think you should guard your energy. That's very important. And protect your peace as you pursue life itself in every sphere. And on that note, thank you very much, Julie, for being part of Deming Chronicles. It's a very hopeful interview, very hopeful chat, some ideas that can add to the value of the, the creatives that you're teaching, the people you are mentoring. Looking forward to changing the creative space with the influence and the energy that Julie brought to Costad. Deming Chronicles season two. We'll be back with you shortly. Welcome back to Deming Chronicles, season two. And our guest, Sonia, who has described herself as a limer. Sonia, tell me about that. How could, how could you be a limer? How could I not be a limer if I want to be a good trainee? 
eh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but there's a kind of bravado that comes with describing yourself as a limer. And it's something that, you know, I don't have the courage to describe myself as such. But tell me, why are you a limer? I'm a limer because just like Julie said just now, you know, you have to protect yourself. You have to protect your own space and your own energy. And I think that's how we do it in Trinidad and Tobago. That's how we even solve problems sometimes, you know, stress, what have you, you go and lime. And so I think that in terms of your actual health and well-being, that's part of what you should be or should try to be, you know. And the other thing about liming is that I, I'm always aiming in whatever project to get to the line. And what I mean by that is that you try to be as efficient as possible in whatever project you're doing so that you can shorten the time you spend on it, the work, so you can get to the play, right? And I think that that is, I mean, it, it doesn't always work, but at least I'm aiming for that, you see? So that, that's how I describe myself as a lime. I'm a very proud lime, thank you very much. <laughs> Proud and it's something that I can aspire to. <laughs> so, yeah, I want us to just think a little about the creative sector in Trinidad and Tobago. And what do you think is needed for that creative sector to thrive? Oh gosh, I mean, there's a whole set of um, sort of dynamics that are somewhat at play now and need to be at play. First of all, I think that we need to, we've started this, I think in the last 20 years to get to tree level training for different creative um, and, uh, areas, right? Um, so that's a good thing. So we don't have to go away for that so that you get people who are more uh, schooled in the, the the art of whatever discipline they're, they're, they're pursuing. So that's a really good thing. But also we need a kind of appreciation of the arts on the ground level that is that, that spreads a little further than it spreads now. A lot of our arts are always, uh, or at least our presentation of arts, not necessarily arts, are uh, always tied to maybe an agenda of some, of some nature uh, you know, a kind of presentational uh, representation of Trinidad and Tobago, what have you. Sometimes that's fine, and sometimes it kind of stymies the creative process because people feel that they, they have to be a particular way, a particular artist in order to get seen. And that I'm, I'm hoping will, with, you know, the new generation, start to dissipate a little more. The other thing in terms of, of, of support for the arts, because again, the arts is, is, is I always say this to people, the arts are not like making widgets, right? You make a widget, then you make a better widget, and then you make a better widget. Now, yes, you might increase your capacity and your acuity in a particular artistic discipline, but it might take you the same time to create a piece of choreography 10 years ago as it does now. Right? There's not that kind of descent into um, the learning curve in the same way, right? So that means that, for instance, I always say, well, did you think Mozart had a deadline? Maybe he did with his patrons, but it takes what it takes, and that's it. So you have to help him by giving him the support that he needed, all right? And that's what the patronage kind of model was back in the day. Now... I always say that I know, I mean, this is modern society. It may not work as, as, as efficiently in modern society, but there's, that's still that level of patronage, that kind of patronage, that kind of support is still needed. So I, for instance, with my dance company, I say, look, it's a laboratory, okay? Think of it as r and I'm experimenting. You would give somebody um, a set of money to experiment to see if they come to some conclusion. Well, give me the same thing because I too am I'm doing an experiment. I am trying to figure it out, all right? I'm trying to figure out a, a theme, how to communicate the theme, how to put together the theme. Should I have a duet? Should I have a solo? Should I have an ensemble piece? Should I have nothing? Should I have what kind of lights? It is R&D, just the way any lab is. So that there's a kind of thinking that has to change to understand that the arts is a process and it is work. At the end of the day, that four-letter word, it is work. It is work. And Sonia, I, you know, I, I have no difficulty with what you're saying, but my dilemma is that I'm not aware of anybody in this country 
giving a significant grant to anybody else in the creative sector in order for them to do the R&D that you have described. And I wonder why has that not happened? What is the hindering factor there? Well, I alluded to the fact that there's this kind of uh, tying of the arts to an agenda, right? So there's a kind of thing where we we'll put a, we we'll put a dance show together, we we'll put a, a variety sh show together, we we'll put a this show together to show what Trinidad and Tobago is, and that's how we'll support it. But while that is fine for one set of activity, the actual creative process needs to breathe in a different way, so that the money that you put into the big production that you take to to, to whatever country because you want to showcase Trinidad and Tobago, do that but do four times that in the country for artists who are working on the ground, who are doing their R and D. Now, yes, I don't know. I think it's historical in answer to your question that there's this, there's never been that, uh, what I call a uh, developed creative uh, economy. All right. Um, in the, in the, a lot of the Caribbean, actually, I find it more in the French um, territories than I do in the English speaking. And that's because they're still tied a lot of the time to France and their system, their ministerial um, cultural system that supports them. Sonia, just describe the difference you're talking about that you see in the French territories. Exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Their Ministry of Culture, they, they, they define culture and they revere culture in a way that I think um, the Caribbean may not, in a sense, okay? <laughs> Pardon? The English-speaking Caribbean. The English-speaking Caribbean. So what happens is that the, um, the but remember, we are, the English-speaking Caribbean is by and large uh, independent of Britain, right? Uh, the French-speaking Caribbean, with the exception of Haiti, is not. They are still département of France, and therefore they can get that kind of government funding. So to give you an example, you know, when I tour, when I used to tour as a dancer to the, to the French Caribbean, I would be paid per performance, very, you know, a decent rate. I would have insurance. I would have all my meals taken care of, my accommodation, my transportation, everything, okay? Um, when I, I also a part of the collective, the um, Contemporary Choreographers Collective, and we run Coco Dance Festival every year. We've done it for, this will be our 13th year. Wow. And, um, it's just bad mind, you know. It's just bad mind that have us doing this festival because it's not money, all right? And it is so, um, the, the dancers and the participants are so generous with their time and their, because remember, it's not just what you see on the stage for four, five, six minutes. That four, five, six minutes translates into hours of rehearsal that people have to spend gas money on, taxi money on to come to, okay? and rehearse, we have to put costumes together, et cetera, et cetera, just for that five minutes, right? It may be, it may be a whole week of work for that five minutes or more, right? Mm -hmm. So that, um, that is the, that's the reality of the situation. Um, but that's why I think the difference between the, the French and, the, and what I would define as English speaking Caribbean for the most part, is that there is there is this this reverence, and that comes from France. You have to give jackets jacket in, in the sense that support of the arts comes uh, that reverence for support of the arts. Whereas in Martinique, Guadeloupe, what have you, would have their own culture, and that too is able to breathe within that support. So the Creole culture can be represented more efficiently and more widespread, and, and somebody can actually be a dancer, and that's all they need to be. That that's their that's their work. It's not a dancer <laughs> after six o'clock. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. So that they can no, do no, my, my experience with a lot of the creative sector is they are all whatever they are, singer, dancer, choreographer, after the eight hour job, after they've done the eight hours. And I wonder what will it take for our society to recognize the creative person and have them in a position where their creativity can fund their lifestyle. Well, I think it's two. It's a it's a sort of a sort of two-edged sword. First of all, the creative sector itself needs to 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 improve some of the things. The creative person needs to understand more things in the wider uh, world of of operations in Trinidad and Tobago, so that. 
while you want to be committed to your art, etc., you have to understand business. And when I was teaching at UTT, I used to say to, to, to the students, I said, look, I need you to understand standard English. I want you to understand the Creole because that's probably how you're going to, um, to, to create your work. But you need to understand standard English because when you have that contract in front of you and you don't understand the English, people can take advantage of you. So just you know, tie it to your profession and see how useful that is. So that there needs to be some kind of understanding of accounting. You don't have to be an accountant, but you have to understand basic parameters. There needs to be some kind of understanding of the legalities of what you're doing. Okay? You need to pay attention to your ethics as well. Okay? And, you, can, and, you know, there's a lot of, because people need money, they go and they, they kind of overstretch themselves over one night. So they're performing for three people a night and they're and they kind of short changing everybody in the process. That's what I mean about ethics, okay? Look at your own ethics and see how, you, you wouldn't want people to treat you that way, you don't treat them that way. So that's one side of the coin. The other side is that the, the non-creative sector, if there's such a thing because everybody's creative in their own way, but I'm, you know, in terms of the people who are not actually artists, etc., I think that they need to understand that the that you know, it's, it's the same Mozart principle that I was talking about. You need to understand that an artist needs investment, okay? Because you do not go to sleep thinking um, that you will wake up and there will be no music in the world. Somebody had to create it, okay? So then, and you're hearing it on the radios, you, the jingle that was composed for your, your product was composed by what? An artist. Okay, so that support the artist. And, and I think one of the ways I discussed in doing this very concretely was to actually go very business on the whole thing and have a, a bond issue specifically for a fund for artists. Okay, because everybody talks about the, you know, the government needs to help. I'm telling you how you could do it, exactly how you could do it. Now with the current economic situation, it may be difficult because you may not be able to get backing for that but you might be able to get a small issue and start there okay so if you have a bond issue backed by the government that has like and i would say maybe about a hundred million dollars to start with to give to artists in a fund from a fund where and the fund is is, is headed by maybe a few people and then those few people are rotated so nobody stays there forever okay and that is how i think concretely you can help the arts in Trinidad and Tobago or any other country. Okay, and what will be the outcome of that bond? So you have the bond, you have a, a administrative body, they issue tranches of that bond to artists. What Correct. Is the measurement criteria for me to say, well, okay, it's not a deadline, but that artist delivered on my expectations. What kind of things would we be looking for? Well, I tell you, I remember um, many, many years ago when uh, I got funding from the film company when they were investing a whole lot more in film. The film company was really, really good about making me have deliverables due in tranches so that I didn't get all the money at the, at, on to, at the top, right? I delivered. I had a, a very a legal document that said I had to deliver X, Y, and Z. Once I delivered X, I got the first tranche. Once I oh, I got the first tranche, and then I delivered X. Then I would get the second tranche. Then I would get the third tranche. It's actually very simple. <laughs> okay, it's very simple. It ain't rocket science. It ain't rocket science or choreography because I put those two on the same line. It, it, it's as difficult. But the fact is that it's not that difficult. Once it is well managed, it is fine. Um, Sonia, this is such a beautiful concept. And as we wrap today's interview, tell me, what would you like people to remember from this short 15 minute interview that we've had? Be efficient so you can lie more. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I am going to have that as my aspiration. More efficiency so I can have more liming after COVID. Right. Chronicles. And on this edition, we chatted with Sonia Dumas, who has a wonderful idea of having a bond. Having a bond, having an administrative framework, 
um, giving money to artists, having deliverables, giving it in tranches, measuring their success, and that could stimulate our entire creative sector. Deming Chronicles, thank you very much for being with us. Like and share this edition. Until next time, be safe. shortly.